everyone. Welcome to another episode of Get Ready. And uh, pleased to have a special guest today, someone who has been in this field teaching about self-love long before it was cool. And uh, to me, it's the coolest thing someone can teach. So let me tell you a little bit about my guest. Dr. Margaret Paul is a best-selling author, writer, and co-creator of the powerful Inner Bonding Self-Healing Process and the related SelfQuest Self-Healing Online Program. Her books include the Do I Have to Give Up Me to Be Loved by You series, the Inner Bonding Workbook, and her most recent Diet for Divine Connection. Margaret holds a PhD in psychology, is a relationship expert, public speaker, consultant, and artist. She has successfully worked with thousands and taught classes and seminars for over 50 years. Welcome to Get Ready, Dr. Margaret Paul. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm so happy to have you here. And as, as I was saying before I hit record, I, the whole issue of loving oneself to me is, is so crucial to this work. But uh, for my audience, uh, please tell us what, uh, why self-love is so important to you. Well, it's important on many, many levels. Um, I deal with people a lot on both the emotional level of emotional responsibility for their feelings, the physical level of taking care of their body, the spiritual level. When we're not loving ourselves, when we're not defining ourselves, when we're not seeing who we really are intrinsically on the inner level, um, then we're abandoning ourselves. So we're either loving ourselves or we're abandoning ourselves. When we abandon ourselves, we create an emptiness inside and then we look to other people to fill that. They have to approve of us. They have to love us. They have to validate us. And this creates huge problems between people because once you make somebody else responsible for loving you because you're abandoning yourself, then you have to try and control them. And everybody hates to be controlled. So then they go into resistance. I mean, it's a mess when people are not loving themselves. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that term before, uh, or, or at least not much self-abandonment. And that's mm -hmm. uh, such a great way of putting it. And then, as you said, that reliance then on getting what we need from other people. Right. And uh, how disempowering that is. And, and inconvenient because, you know, darn it, even if people are around, which so often they're not, they don't yeah. always give us what we say we want. Right. That's right. Well, and then what happens if they don't? What do you do when they don't? Right. You know, do you get mad? Do you then sacrifice yourself to try and have more control? Do you um, withdraw your love? What do you do? And the things that people usually do then create more problems in the relationship. Well, and, and the other thing is, is that when we're not loving ourselves, see, when people learn to love themselves, they learn to get all filled up inside with love then they have love to share. And that's, to me, the most extraordinary experience in life, two people sharing love. That's a loving relationship. But if you're abandoning yourself, you're empty. There's no love in there. So there's no love to share. So then people go to people to get love rather than to share love. And that's a big problem. Yeah, yeah, that's why I've often said to people, because people so often think of self-love as being a selfish thing. It's like, no, it's a total win-win situation. Because when you feel all that love, then you have love to share. Right. That's right. And, and selfishness, people don't understand what selfishness is. When you're not loving yourself, then you're expecting somebody else to do it. You're expecting them to give themselves up to give you what you need. To me, that's selfish. Yeah. And then you're trying to control them in order to get what you want. To me, then you're not supporting them in what's loving to them. That's selfish. So loving ourselves means that we're actually taking responsibility for our own feelings. We're not making somebody else responsible for our pain, for our joy. Now, most people don't understand what loving yourself means. They think, oh, you know, I go to the gym and I take a hot bath and I eat well, <laughs> and that's great on the physical level, yeah. but it does nothing on the emotional level. So, you know, pretend that, that you've got a child that comes to you upset 
And instead of addressing that and being with the child with caring and compassion and wanting to understand, you're, you're off on your computer. You say, I'm sorry, I got to go to the gym and work out. That child's going to feel rejected and abandoned. And we do that to ourselves all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, so it's not, it's not just self-care, but it's a, a much broader, a much broader level of acknowledgement. Well, it's self-care. It is physical yeah. self-care, certainly, right, but emotional right. self-care is completely different. And unfortunately, very few of us grew up with parents who knew how to role model emotional responsibility. I mean, who, who had parents that that we saw taking responsibility for your own feelings? They, my parents blamed me. Uh, they blamed each other. Uh, they blamed whatever they could. They got mad. They withdrew. I mean, all kinds of role modeling that, of course, I learned uh, that I had to unlearn. So where are the role models for people actually saying, gosh, I'm feeling anxious. I wonder what I'm telling myself and how I'm treating myself that's making me so anxious. Right. right. And so few people role modeling genuine self-love. Yeah. So, so, so a few of us had parents that were self-actualized enough to be able to say, I'm fantastic and you're fantastic too. And you should just know that and don't depend upon me to know. <laughs> don't wait for my validation to know how awesome you are. Well, and, and so many of us had parents who defined their worth externally. You know, they're, they're okay if they're making a certain amount of money or they look a certain way or, or they've achieved a certain amount of fame or whatever, but it's all external or, or so many people love them or so many people are their friends. Very few parents help their children to value their intrinsic qualities, their kindness, their caring, their compassion, their empathy, their generosity, their honesty, their integrity. I mean, to me, these are the enduring qualities. Like you might be a fantastically looking person, but you're going to get old and you're going to use, lose that. And does that mean you have no worth? You see, or, or maybe you're going to lose your money or whatever. So does that mean you have no worth? And so um, most people have never learned to define themselves on the inner level and to let the expression of who they are um, then express in the world. And of course, there's nothing wrong with achieving and, you know, earning money and looking your best. Right. But hopefully that's going to come from um, you're valuing yourself rather than doing it as a way to define yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would imagine that as you try to try to get that external validation without acknowledging who you are, then um, it's it, it, it tends to be then the trappings of success as opposed to what feels like a genuine success. Well, and yeah, and, you know, we all know of people who have a ton of money and they're miserable. <laughs> You know, they've achieved all kinds of success and they're miserable or they commit suicide or whatever. So that, you know, that external success isn't doing it. And, and they thought it would. So they say, well, why am I miserable? And they're miserable because they don't know who they are and they're abandoning themselves. Right, right. And, and that craving that external validation and needing that external is, is what many of us, if not most of us, have had role modeled. And so it's not surprising that we're there and it kind of puts us in a victim stance because we're, we don't, we're not empowered. We don't have control over that. So, so how do we stop abandoning ourselves? <laughs> well, let me talk about the four major ways that people abandon themselves because most people just aren't aware of this. And yeah. one of the ways is that they, we've all learned to be up in our head. When, when we were kids growing up, um, our feelings are in our body, but there may have been a lot of pain and so we couldn't deal with the pain. So we learned to disconnect from our body and go up in our head. So again, if a kid comes to you upset and you're just reading your book and you're on your computer and you're just not attending, that kid's gonna feel abandoned. So we do that. We, we disconnect from our body so that we don't even feel our feelings. Right. We don't even know what's going on inside. So that's one form of self-abandonment. Another is that most people have learned to harshly judge themselves. 
you know, people tell him, says, I'm not good enough. I'm going to end up on the streets. Uh, I'm not important. I'm flawed. I'm not as good as others. I mean, most people have absorbed many false beliefs because they don't know who they are intrinsically. And so they're judging themselves by their looks and by their performance and they don't measure up. And so, of course, if you constantly said to a child, you're not good enough, the child's going to feel rejected. And that's what we do to ourselves. And the third way is we numb out with so many addictions. You know, so many people, as soon as they have an uncomfortable feeling, they get anxious, they get depressed, they feel guilty, they feel shame, they feel angry, they feel alone, they feel empty. What do they do? They graze in front of the refrigerator, they grab the drink, they grab the cigarette, they take the drug, they turn on the TV, they surf the channels, they go to pornography, they, they do social media, I mean, they go to video games, they try and get somebody else to have sex with them. And there's so many ways that people act out addictively yeah. to avoid responsibility for their feelings. Yeah. And then the fourth way is they make other people responsible. It's like if you had a child and instead of taking care of the child, you kept finding somebody else. You know, do you want this child? Do you want to adopt this child? Do you want to take care of this child? That child's going to feel rejected. People do that all the time. And of course, we feel then empty, rejected, and abandoned on the inner level. And then we project that out to others, thinking they're the ones doing it to us. Right. Right. Because no so, one's ever shown us how. <laughs> no, they haven't. And so that is what I teach. I teach uh, the inner bonding process, which is a very powerful six-step process for learning to love yourself physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, relationally, organizationally. These are all levels where we need to take responsibility, but it starts emotionally. And so when people learn these simple six steps, and of course it takes practice like anything with learning, they start loving themselves. Life changes quite rapidly when people recognize that it's up to them that nobody else as adults, nobody else on the planet wants that job. I mean, that was like, oh my God, there's not a single person on the planet that wants to make me feel like I'm okay. It's up to me. Because most of them are so busy trying to find somebody else to make them feel okay. Right, well, and then we attract a partner at our common level of self-abandonment or our common level of self-love. So if we're abandoning ourselves, you know, somebody who's really loving themselves is not going to be attracted to somebody who's abandoning themselves. They just don't connect with that person. Right. And so then what happens is that people who abandon themselves get hooked up with each other, expecting the other person to fill them up and, and validate them. And then of course it doesn't happen because each person's abandoning themselves. Then they blame the other person. They leave the relationship, they move on and they do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it right the next time. Right. Uh, yeah, so don't. <laughs> that always drove me nuts about the, the line in Jerry Maguire when they said, you complete me as though we're two broken pieces trying to fit together. <laughs> that's right. And that's what people believe. I'm not complete. I'm empty. But this person who I have fallen in love with, they'll make me complete. Yeah. Yeah. Which then becomes a, another one of those addictions of uh, trying to trying to find something to numb the pain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and, and look at what happens in our country with medication to block out anxiety or depression, which is very sad to me, because one of the things that I teach is that all of our feelings have information for us. Feelings like anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, anger, aloneness, jealousy, they're telling us that we're abandoning ourselves. Sometimes they're telling us we're emotionally abandoning ourselves. They may also be telling us we're physically abandoning ourselves. They may be telling us that we have trauma from the past that we need to attend to, but they're telling us something. Yeah. And when we block them out with medication, I'm not saying don't take medication, but it, it's not, it's not going to cure you. It may give you a window to do the work you need to do. Yeah. Um, but when people just numb out instead of, open to learning. See, one of the basis of the inner bonding process is that there's only two intentions. 
One is the intention to protect against pain with various forms of controlling behavior. And the other is the intention to learn about loving yourself. And so when people open to learning about loving themselves, and one of the things we teach people to do is to access a higher source of information, a higher source of love and wisdom. And it's, it's not very hard to do, and they don't have to have any particular belief system to do it. But like I said, because there's no role models for loving ourselves or very few, yeah. we have to go to a higher source. <laughs> And that information is there when we know how to tap into it. And so we teach people when they're abandoning themselves, when they're unhappy, when they realize that their feelings are coming from some form of self-abandonment, but they don't know what to do. We teach them how to open to that higher self that actually does know what to do. And then they can start to take that action. And when people start to take loving action on their own behalf, that's when they start to feel so much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, people often talk about negative emotions and I would say, no, 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 there are no negative emotions because all emotions have a purpose. There are uncomfortable emotions, but, uh, but yeah, as you said, it, it, it gives a message. Like I'll often say, anger is, is like a smoke detector. Right. When that alarm is going off, it's trying to tell you something that need, that something needs to be dealt with. And yeah, you don't want to numb it out. You don't want to just pull the, the, the thing out and say, well, I don't like that noise. Yeah. Finding that, that, and we, we often don't know what to do with that, but finding that higher self that goes, yes, you go get the fire extinguisher, you go into the kitchen and you put out the fire and then you don't have to hear that alarm anymore. Yeah, and anger is interesting because so often, and most of the time, people think, oh, well, I'm angry because you yelled at me or you didn't uh, do your part of the work or whatever. And, and one of the things I teach people to do about anger is turn it around. And that, that inner part of ourselves that's angry, ask that part, what are you angry at me about? How, how am I not taking care of you? Yeah. How am I abandoning you? Because anger at others is often a projection of some way we're not taking care of ourselves. And, and then there's, there's another set of feelings, which I call the existential feelings of like things like loneliness when we can't connect to somebody or grief over loss or, or helplessness over somebody else being so unloving or heartbreak, you know, when people have been really hurtful. So we don't cause these feelings, but we're still responsible for learning to manage them in loving ways. And because we did not have the role modeling for how to handle these feelings, then we protect against them with all of our forms of control and avoidance. <laughs> so many of which just aren't that healthy. <laughs> no, they cause more pain. Right. <laughs> I'm going to go smash a few things. That'll make me feel better. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'll make me feel better for the moment. See, yeah. you know, they work for the moment. Addictions work for the moment. Exactly. Feel better. And that's how they become addictions. But how long do they work? Right. Right. And it's when we get into that moment of, of self-abandonment or whatever is causing the pain. And in that moment, we don't think clearly. It's like, what's easy to reach for? <laughs> Even if I know it's going to cause more damage tomorrow in this moment, I can't find, I can't figure out anything else. And we go to those habitual uh, numbing techniques. Yeah, because they don't know how to manage their feelings with love, with compassion. And, and you said something really important is that they're not thinking well. And when we are in our lower brain, the amygdala, that's the fight or flight. Right. We can't think well, we get very reactive. We just act out whatever we've learned to do that comes from fear. But when people learn and practice inner bonding, they're actually developing new neural pathways in their higher brain. And so the, the more they practice attending to their feelings and taking loving action for themselves and accessing that higher wisdom, the more they develop those higher pathways. And eventually it becomes more natural to turn to what we call the loving adult, which is our, our higher brain. Yeah. Um, and, and we have access 
to what would be loving to ourselves and others rather than just reacting from our lower brain. Right. That's that scared part of us. Right. So what can what is a, a first step that we can take towards moving into that that higher self that rather than the self abandonment? Well, the first step of inner bonding is um, the journey from your head to your heart and soul. It's about getting present in your body. And I teach people uh, mindful breathing to breathe in and, and, and use their breath to get inside their body and scan their body and notice what's happening in there. For me, it took a long time to be able to do that because I had been taught to take care of everybody else's feelings, but not my own. And so I was just, you know, so disconnected from my body. So it took practice to learn to get present with my feelings so that I call it having your inner baby monitor on. Like, if you, have a baby, <laughs> you know, if you have a baby and you want to be a good parent, you don't just put the baby to sleep and go out to lunch. Right. <laughs> they're doing when they're up in their head or numbing out. So you have a baby monitor on and the minute the baby cries, you pick up the baby. You want to know what's wrong. The baby can't tell you, but you know, maybe the baby's hungry or, or needs a diaper change or just is lonely and needs to be rocked. That's what we need to start to do on the inner level, have our inner baby monitor on so that we can attend to our feelings rather than avoid them. So that's a first step that people can do. So just allowing ourselves to pay attention to that. Right. Yeah. To get present, get present with compassion, not with judgment. Sometimes people are aware of their feelings, but they judge them instead of, you know, like saying to a kid, don't cry over spilt milk, you know, that judgment rather than getting <laughs> desire to learn. Yeah. Not only do you feel bad, but you're bad for feeling bad. That's right. That's right. A lot of people have been taught that. Don't yeah. feel bad. That's yeah. so sad. Yeah. I like to say that self-sabotage is simply misguided self-love. And so when it, it, it helps, thinking in terms of that helps us to be more compassionate with ourselves so that, you know, even when we're in the midst of, using some unhealthy form to try to deal with that. It's like, okay, I'm not a bad person. I just have this habit and I'm trying to take care of myself as I, as I reach for that, uh, that second pint of Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> it's like, I, I, this is trying to be an act of self-love, <laughs> just a misguided act of self-love. Well, yeah, I mean, people are doing the best they can if they don't know what else to do. They only know to numb their feelings because they don't know how to lovingly manage them. And so one of the things that I hope people will do, I, I have an ebook called um, The Four Mistakes That Block Self-Love and Relationships. And I'm hoping that, that people will read that. It's a free ebook and we'll read that. And I'll have a link to that here below. So yeah. excellent. That'll be a big, big help to people. Starting people in that, in that right direction of... Uh... <laughs> Put, put the baby monitor on. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, but, you know, like anything worth learning, it just takes practice. People forget to do it. They forget to stay present because they've been practicing so long being up in their head. Right. They just forget they have a body that's feeling. <laughs> right, right. Certainly in, in our Western culture, that's definitely where we're taught all about being in our heads. And, uh you know, and maybe, maybe in school we had a PE class. So there's a little bit about the body. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah but, but not the feelings, you know, yeah. like, like, you know, I tell people, if you were to numb your hands, like people numb their bodies, and then you touch a hot stove, you could get badly burned because you wouldn't feel it. You wouldn't know you're burning your hand. Well, this is what happens inside is that when people numb out and with their various addictions, they don't know that they're hurting themselves. And that's very sad. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely when we need a baby monitor. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's like to, to pay attention to that, that part of it. Cause yeah, it's so much of us, so many of us either, either have so much training about, being numbed out or just don't have the training about how to pay attention yeah. and, and how to be aware. It's certainly something that I see with a lot of people and saying, you know, checking with how you're feeling. It's like, I'm sorry, what is this you're speaking? Is this a different language? Yeah. 
You know, when, when I was learning to tune into my body, I did so many things. I wore a rubber band on my wrist. I put sticky notes around telling me to tune in. I had a little gadget called the motivator that buzzed against my body because I couldn't remember. I was so used to tuning into others' feelings and, and protecting myself by being a good girl that I couldn't remember to get present. So it took practice. It took reminders. And, you know, today people can have reminders on their cell phones to tune into your body, what's happening inside. And as Yoda said, you must unlearn what you have learned with so many of the, <laughs> exactly. so many of the messages that we have about, well, and just what you were saying about having to take care of other people and, 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 and all that stuff about needing the external validation and not paying attention to what, what the soul needs and, and what, what real self-love feels like. Yes, that's right. And it's so life-changing. So, I mean, my life has changed so completely as I learned to love myself on, on all those levels. And, and, you know, it's not just emotional. So many people abandon themselves physically with all the sugar and junk food and all the stuff they put in their bodies that makes them sick. And that's another level of loving yourself is to be willing to, I see my body as the house of my soul and it's my job to create a healthy house for my soul. And so I'm very motivated to have a healthy body. And I love that you put it that way, because this is one of the things that has come up with, when I've talked to some people about self-love and people sometimes express a concern of, well, if I love myself right where I'm at, you know, and maybe that's in a bad relationship or in a job that I hate or 50 pounds overweight, if I love myself where I'm at, then I won't feel motivated. I'm like, no, if you like, if you had a baby and the baby and you love this baby and the baby was crying because it was hungry, you wouldn't say, well, I love the baby even when it's crying. So I'm not going to feed it. No, when you love someone, you want to give that person the best. So if we really love ourselves, we are actually more motivated to take better care of ourselves, not, not less motivated thinking, well, I've got nothing to improve. <laughs> well, and, and the other thing that has motivated me and so many of the people I work with is that in order to access that higher wisdom, um, that, that higher wisdom exists at a higher frequency than we operate at. So yeah. we have to raise our frequency. And it takes two things. One, we have to be open to learning about loving ourselves. Boy, that really raises the frequency, that intention to learn. The other is we have to keep our body clean of all the junk because the junk lowers the frequency and makes it really hard. And when I put those together, that, that frequency is on both the physical level and the emotional level, that's when I started to experience what I call at-will spiritual connection. Mm. I'm that all day long. All day long, I am getting messages about what's loving to me. And I ask, I say, okay, what's loving to me now? Bam, the answer is there. So, of course, that took a lot of practice, but so many of my clients are able to do that, to have at will divine connection. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, it, and that makes me think of the, um, the line of, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things should be added unto you. And I, I made a video uh, based on that called seek ye first to feel good, that, that idea that being in the kingdom of God, heaven, you know, not, not to make it um, religious for those who are not religious, but being in that state of connection right. and all the awesome things that you just naturally draw into your life. And even before those things show up, just, it just feels awesome inside. Oh yeah, it does. And that is how we manifest. We manifest when we can be in that connection and then co-create with our higher guidance. And boy, is that exciting. Yeah. What an exciting thing to be able to do every day. Yeah. And again, even before the things show up, it just feels awesome. Right. <laughs> like, I know great things are coming and I feel great right now as they're coming. And that's a key. That's a key, Brad, is to feel great right now. Because yeah. if you're attaching, you're feeling good to the outcome, then you're going to try and control it. <laughs> right, right. Just like you were saying at the beginning about the validation and, right. and trying to get that validation from outside. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's a big key for people is that, you know, uh, to not attach to the outcome doesn't mean we don't want particular outcomes, but it means we don't attach our happiness and our worth and our well-being to the outcome. 
I mean, of course, we all want the outcome we want. There's nothing wrong with that. But we got to be happy and excited now, not just when we get what we think we need. And that happiness and excitement draws it more powerfully to us. That's right. That's exactly right. So awesome. Awesome. What? All kinds of great bits of wisdom, and and you have more to share in in the ebook. I thank you so much for for sharing these insights and and techniques. Um, I'm really grateful for the work you're doing and for you showing up and sharing this with my audience. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on, Brad. <laughs>